I'm Corbin, the leather product specialist here at Sellrite, and I have the privilege of sharing my love for leather craft with you all and hopefully inspiring you to embark on your own DIY projects. In this fundamental series, we're going to walk through the essential skills and concepts that you need in order to start your own leather crafting journey. I'll walk you through and demonstrate the skills by working on a couple of projects. That's going to be a tote bag and a wallet. So follow along with me throughout this series if you want to learn how to make a project like this for yourself. Now let's dive into the first step of every project. That's gonna be choosing the right leather. If you're already familiar with this phase of the process and you're comfortable with this step, you can go ahead and skip to this timestamp in the video and that'll be where I start to show you my favorite process for dyeing and finishing leather. Well, we're gonna start with the four points to consider when choosing leather in order to set up your project for success. It's gonna be weight, temper, tanning method, and finish. Leather weight or thickness is usually represented in ounces per square foot whereas one ounce of leather is gonna be about 0.4 millimeters of thickness. Most leather falls between two to 12 ounces, where two ounces is about 0.8 millimeters thick, and 12 ounces is nearly five millimeters thick. As a rule of thumb, I categorize leather like this. Two to four ounce leather is for wallets, small accessories, and liners. Four to six ounces for bags, journal covers, and laptop sleeves. And nine to 12 ounces for belts, sheets, and other heavy duty straps. Those are just a few examples, of course, there's exceptions to those, but it's a good starting point to understand the continuum of leather weights. And another rule of thumb is that the further towards extremes that you get as far as leather weights, the more difficult it becomes to work with. Um, so for leather that's really thin, it's gonna just be more fragile and as you cut it, it might warp or bend. Um, and then on the opposite side of that spectrum of really heavy leather, it's just gonna be super stiff. So if you're trying to form that into anything and create any sort of shape or sew leathers, uh, it's just gonna cause you some problems. So the most workable, easiest range is gonna be anywhere from two to seven ounces. Uh, and then even more specifically than that, four to five ounces is gonna be a great starting point because you can skive that down, which means you're thinning out the leather to get something like a two to three ounce for a wallet, or you can just stack it up, sew it, and then there you go, you've got a nine to 10 ounce if you're doing a belt or some heavy straps. The temper of leather describes how stiff or flexible it is and how well it's gonna hold its shape. It's the result of the tightness or looseness of the fibers that make up the leather and also the way it's processed and manufactured. And so a soft temper leather is gonna be stretchy, more flexible, and it's not gonna really maintain its shape. Whereas something that has more of a firm temper is gonna be much more stiff, more rigid, and it'll maintain its shape as we hold it. So it's good for projects that require a little bit more structure, whereas this softer temper, I hold it up and it's just gonna fall right down. A common misconception is that the thickness dictates the temper of the leather, but it's entirely possible to have a thin leather with a firm temper and vice versa. These last couple of swatches that I've been using to demonstrate, this is actually a two to three ounce leather and it has a much firmer temper. And this one is actually a four to five ounce with that soft and supple temper. So that just goes to show that no matter the thickness of the leather, that temper can vary pretty drastically. Choosing the wrong weight and temper can make your project a lot more difficult to make and the final product will be less functional and maybe even less durable. So for our wallet project, I'll use this two to three ounce leather panel that I've been showing you. Uh, and this is our veg tan leather. It's got a much firmer temper and uh, a thin profile, uh, but it'll give us the, the structure we need for a durable wallet. And for the tote bag, I'm actually gonna use this four to five ounce leather, which is just a bit thicker, um, but it still has that medium to firm temper. And it'll give our bag a bit more heft and rigidity it needs to hold its shape while still being easy to work with. Tanning is the process of turning animal hide into leather that we can work with. Skins can be tanned in two main ways. It's gonna be vegetable or veg tanned and then chrome tanned. So let's break down the difference between these two tanning methods and the leathers that they produce. Vegetable tanning is the traditional, natural, old fashioned method that's been used for thousands of years to tan leather. And in this process, the leather sits in a vat of natural tannins um, derived from things like tree bark, nuts, and leaves. And this is where we get the term vegetable from. And veg tan leather patinas nicely over time meaning it gets darker, develops a sheen, you know what I would call a depth in terms of the color and the finish of the surface. And personally, this is my favorite part about leather crafting, is just seeing the item that I made um, kind of develop its own unique characteristics over time uh, based on my lifestyle and how I use it. So here's a couple wallets, business card holder and a um, quick card holder wallet. And so this is going on about 18 months of patina, whereas this is more like eight months. Same leathers, both undyed veg tan, and you just see how they've aged over time pretty beautifully. Um, so like this one, it's got the strap there. So it just has a really unique look. And even on the back, I wear a lot of jeans. And so like the indigo from my jeans has rubbed off. 
So that's one of my favorite parts about leatherworking is just see the way that these items I make age over time and develop their own unique characteristics as I use them every day. Moving on to chrome tanning, it's a more modern innovation of the leather tanning process and it uses chromium sulfate as a tanning agent and takes just hours, whereas VED tanning takes more like a month. Chrome tanning leather is usually more affordable and it comes in a wider variety of colors and finishes. Um, so you might prefer chrome tan leather if you don't really want as much of that patina effect and you want the color of your leather to stay more consistent over time. Um, and like I mentioned, it's also typically more affordable. Um, so very beginner friendly if you don't want to try out your skills on expensive leather for the first time. If you're a fan of the Western style leather craft, which involves tooling, carving, and stamping, you should probably avoid chrome tan leather because it doesn't take stamps very well. And sometimes you might be able to get away with simple alphabet stamps, but intricate carving and tooling is gonna be impossible on those chrome tan leathers. Fetch tan leather readily accepts tooling and stamping, making it a better choice if you do want to carve a design into a leather piece. The last major difference I should mention is that veg tan leathers can be burnished to achieve a slicked edge with a nice sheen. Chrome tan leathers do not burnish well, so you may want to consider painting them or folding your edges over before sewing for a neater look on those edges. A quick note on other terms you might have heard, I would suggest you avoid anything that says genuine or bonded leathers because they're very low quality. What they do is manufacturers take the worst parts of the hide, the bottom layer of the skin, the furthest from the top grain, or byproducts in the manufacturing process and they just glue them together to make that genuine and bonded leather. Think of real leather as a piece of solid wood and think of bonded or genuine leather as like particle board. It's just the byproducts all sandwiched together and uh, they call it that because it's a good marketing trick, but don't buy it, it's bad stuff. Leather can have different finishes in terms of its texture, feel, and sheen. And the grain, which is that top part of the leather, might be smooth or pebbled or somewhere in between. And when you're handling those leathers, some might feel more dry, waxy, or oily. Leather can be dyed in almost any color imaginable and have a top coat ranging from a high gloss to a matte finish. And some people prefer to do this process yourself um, or you can buy it pre-dyed and finished. So if you do wanna do it yourself, now we're gonna go into my favorite way of dyeing and finishing leather. And like I mentioned earlier, Sailrite offers dozens of dyes and several finishes. But in this video, we're gonna focus on my favorite method and products. If you do want a more comprehensive overview, check out this video on the channel. All right, so the first step I do when oiling and dyeing leather is I just get the piece that I'm gonna be using. In this case, this is the swatch that I'm gonna use for our wallet. And I like to oil and dye the whole piece at once because inevitably when you dye something or apply oil, you get some spillover onto the backside of your workpiece um, or on the front as well. Try to give you a better look at that. And so I want to avoid that. I think that makes the final project look a little more sloppy. So I like to do everything in one go, get a whole panel of our dyed leather, and then I'll cut my pieces for the wallet out of that. So let's do our Neats Foot Oil. You can use any lint-free rag or an old t-shirt you have lying around the house. That's what I use for years. And one trick that I do to kind of just make it easy to work with, do a little ball of fabric and wrap this one around that. So now I've got some surface area there as I applying the oil. This first coat of Neats Foot Oil, we're gonna be um, pretty liberal with how much we apply because it's pretty forgiving. As long as you don't get a big drop in one spot, it'll all even out nicely. And what this Neats Foot Oil is gonna do is it's just gonna hydrate and uh, condition the leather to better take the dye so that we get a more even application of our dye. Because the last thing I want on my leather projects is dye um, to have streakiness or splotchiness we want a nice uniform application of our dye. And a second reason that the Neats Foot Oil is essential in my opinion is because we're going to be using an alcohol-based dye and the alcohol tends to dry up the leather a little bit. So this Neats Foot Oil is gonna offset that. So we're gonna do it now to condition our piece. And then even after we dye, we're gonna hit it again with some more Neats Foot Oil. And now that we've got our Neats Foot Oil applied to our piece, we'll give that a few minutes to dry and then we can move on to the dyeing process. After applying the Neats Foot Oil and letting it dry for about five minutes, we're ready to apply our Feebing's Leather Dye. For a deep dark color on your piece, you can use just the dye with the dauber right on your workpiece. Or if you want to have a little bit of a lighter color, I like to dilute mine. Um, and based on whatever type of dye you use, this is an alcohol-based dye. So we just have some rubbing alcohol and that's what I use to dilute it. 
But for an oil-based dye, use oil. Water-based, use water. Right now, we're using one part dye to four part rubbing alcohol for this project. So before I do that, I'm gonna throw on my gloves because if you get this dye on you, um, you'll be blue for a few days. So if you wanna avoid that, make sure to wear some gloves, get some cardboard to protect your work surface, just so you don't get stains all over your stuff. Make sure you show every minute of me wrestling these gloves. Or you could do a little time lapse with like some clown music. So I'll put some of our dye in this little container here. When dyeing leather, it's extremely important to test on a sample piece of leather, on a piece of scrap, just so you can experiment and see how many coats it takes to get the color you want and get the uniformity of color you want. So save your project, test on some scraps, and it'll save you some time and some heartache in the long run, for sure. And the way that I like to apply the dye is with our large Cellrite wool daubers. A lot of times you see these and they're real small, but we sell the big ones, which is fantastic just because it gives you a broader surface area so this works great or you can just use another lint-free cloth or t-shirt whatever you got lying around so we'll start off here applying our dye don't want to overdo it because we don't want to get it concentrated into any one area we're going to take several passes at this and we'll get started just in some nice circles i'll do this first pass uh, with these circles just to lay down the base coat and then each pass i take it's gonna end up being probably three or four or even five, depending on what our color is looking like. It's important to change the angle of each application. Start with swirls, then vertical lines, then horizontal lines, and finish with swirls again. So now we're gonna do vertical lines. Now we're gonna do some horizontal lines. Now we're gonna finish off with some swirls. All right, so now we've got about four coats or four passes with our dye. And if you still aren't satisfied with your color, you can do another coat, repeat the process until you get the darkness you want or the uniformity you want. I'm pretty happy with this after four coats. So we're gonna leave it at that and continue on to our next step. All right, I've given that dye about 10 minutes to dry and we can go ahead and move on to the next step, which is gonna be another coat of Neatsfoot oil. Just because like I said earlier, the alcohol in the dye does tend to dry out the leather. So we're gonna give it some more Neatsfoot oil to compensate for any of that dryness. And it's only been 10 minutes. That's actually my favorite part about the uh, Phoebing's leather dye is because it dries super quickly. So you can get on with your project. A lot of oil-based dyes, you apply it and then you've got to wait hours or even a day, depending on the humidity of your climate. So I'm gonna use my same Neats foot cloth that I used earlier and go ahead and apply that. And not only does it rehydrate it, but it also is gonna even out any subtle splotchiness we have. Another point to mention is that this coat of Neats foot oil is gonna be a little bit lighter than our first one where we applied it more liberally. All right, so now while we let that Neats foot oil dry for a little bit, another five or 10 minutes, I'll go ahead and tell you about one of my favorite finishes that I use. My current favorite is the Phoebing's Leather Balm with Atom Wax. It is great because I like that you can buff it into the leather. And what that means is those waxes, the friction and the heat combined with those waxes really melts them into the leather and provides that protective coat. Whereas another popular option, Resiline, it goes on more like a paint. So just different applications. This has more of a high gloss. This is more of a medium gloss. But like I said, I love the fact that this is forgiving because you can just buff it until you get that sheen level that you're looking for. I'm gonna go ahead and put the leather balm in its own separate container because as we're applying the top coat, we're probably gonna get some dye that's gonna bleed out into our rag. So let's get a clean dauber here. Another good point to mention is when we apply this, uh, I don't like to put too much because then it's more buffing you gotta do to buff away all those waxes. So this is just a light coat and then we'll buff it away and get a nice gloss here in a second. Now it's time to buff that wax that we just laid down. And the more we buff, the more shine we're gonna get. So I'm gonna use just that lint-free lint cloth we used earlier, but a clean one. And just give it some friction. The more heat, the better. Whew. Now that we've worked up a sweat, I'm pretty happy with that level of gloss. And we've arrived at my favorite part of the leather dyeing process. And at this stage, I like to get the leather and kind of crumple it up. And what that does is it kind of creates a sort of pull-up effect, which is when you bend up the leather and in those creases that you create, 
some of the lighter hues start to show through. If you can see kind of how that comes on on camera. And you can just manipulate it, kind of, it's more of an art. Just get the creases wherever you want it. So we can have some nice lighter parts show up. And I think this gives it a lot of character. I really like the way it looks. And also an added benefit is if you did dye your leather and you've got some splotchiness or some streaks, this does a pretty good job at hiding some of those mistakes. All right, so now we've got some nice lighter parts of the leather. It kind of makes for an interesting look. If you're not a big fan of this look, you can just skip that process to have a more flat, even coat of dye. And finally, there's an optional last step if you want to add one more coat of leather balm just to get more sheen or more protection. But I'm actually pretty happy with what we have here. I think this is going to be perfect for the leather wallet that we're going to be working on throughout this fundamental series. And so if you follow along with these steps, hopefully you've got a good result and you've got a beautifully dyed piece of leather ready for your next project. So I hope you learned a thing or two from this first fundamentals video. And be sure to watch the other videos in this series um, so you can learn more and see our wallet and tote bag projects take shape. And if you wanna follow along with me to make your own tote or wallet, head over to the link in the description to see all the leather, dyes, finishes, and tools that Sarah White has to offer. And thanks again for watching this video and we'll see you in the next one.